let's switch gears here and get started on a new topic. So, the problem that we've been solving for the last several class periods has been, here is the charge, what is the E-field as a result of that charge? What I'm going to show you now in this portion of the field analysis is how to undo that result. To say, here is the field, so what was the charge that made that field? Um, and this is basically an application of Gauss's law. So let's go ahead. and take a look at Gauss's law in integral form. So, in order to talk about this, so let me write that down, because this is a really important thing. This is how you use it. Coulomb's law Find field given charge. And the integral form of Gauss's law, we find a charge given field. And to do this, to really do this right, uh, we define a new quantity in field theory. And that is the electric flux density vector. They call it a flux density because really what it is used for is counting charge. It gives the unit D with a vector on it. And you multiply it by the material, which in this class will always be represented, uh, its properties will always be re represented by a scalar real value electric permittivity. Spell it right. Times the electric field. And the reason why we do that is because this gives it units of coulombs per meter squared. So you can see why we call it electric flux density. We're kind of look, looking at the charge flux. Basically, uh, uh, and it's, it's a density, so it's spread out over per units of meters squared. Now, the reason why this is a very useful concept is consider the, the case of a parallel plate capacitor. Where I had two plates, I'm looking at the side of two plates. This has a bunch of positive charges on top of it. So it's got a plus rho sub s surface charge density. And the bottom has a minus rho sub s negative surface charge density. Well, of course, I'm going to have some sort of E field impressed upon here. Well, if I define this quantity, D equals to epsilon times E, then the D field will be constant between these two plates, no matter what kind of stuff I fill it up with. So I could put a material in there, I could put some Teflon with dielectric close to like four, I could put some barium titanate particles in there, that dielectric part permittivity, real permittivity close to like 60 times that of free space um, or higher. Uh, I could put anything in there. And air, which has close to epsilon naught. And my D value for that problem, the way I've defined it, is going to be constant. The E pro field actually changes. And the reason that's true is because of the fundamental f mechanism, the physical mechanism for dielectric permittivity. What's happening is you've got these molecules inside substances. And if you've got uh, no material here, you have in, in here uh, a free space D field, epsilon times your free space electric field. And we view that as a sort of impressed field due to the charge. So if you think about an impressed field proportional to your D vector, 
This is the field that would be there between the two plates. with nothing there. Well, when you put something there, the molecules in between that constitute the material resting between the two plates. You know, molecules are really positive nuclei and negative electrons circulating them, right? And they have some freedom to move and to stretch. So if I press an E field onto a molecule that has a negative electrons circulating a positive nuclei. What's going to happen, we know that positive stuff wants to travel in the direction of the field arrow, and negative stuff wants to go the other way. So what happens is that the molecules deform themselves, and they make a tiny little, what we call a countervailing dipole in the material. The nucleus goes, is kind of tugged this way, the electrons are tugged up the opposite direction. And what you'll now have, we call it countervailing because the electric field local to this atom or, or molecule points in the opposite direction of the impressed field. And of course there are lots of these all over the place that are doing this. So statistically we call this the polarization field in electromagnetics. Uh, the field that the, the material creates in response to an impressed electric field, such that the total field, the combination of these two, when you add these two together, is much smaller. Uh, yes? Is that the thing like um take a magnet and it iron dust or something and you see it um, mm. around, you see like that circular pressure around the middle? Yeah, that's, it's a similar concept to that, but that's permeability. And I'll give you a lecture in a couple of weeks about the nature of permeability. Dielectric permittivity is very simple. It's, it's making countervailing fields by stretching molecules, the electrons and, and uh, neutron, uh, protons, nuclei on, on molecules. Magnetic phenomenon are very, it's very similar. They have a corresponding flux density that we use, and that's kind of what you're seeing when you see the iron filings on the bar magnet go around in your example. Uh, but the, the mechanisms that give rise to magnetic behavior are much more varied than dielectric materials. There are probably a half a dozen that we'll talk about in class, and then there's probably dozens of more if you want to get down into like nitty-gritty specifics. And where, where would you see something like this? Would you only see it on an oscilloscope or like the um... mm. So I guess the way that you would see something like this is if you t <laughs> if you had like little dielectric filings, you know, little bits of Teflon that you've ground up, and you put a really strong E field, uh, and then maybe you put a cardboard on top of it and sprinkle them on, you might be able to see it that way. They might kind of align themselves. Um, I have to think about that if that would actually work. But the, the thing is that, that what you're seeing with the iron filings is kind of an artifact of how the iron filings kind of work anyway. There's no such thing as like a field line in nature. There are, there's flux density. And it just so happens that the little particles of steel actually concentrate the flux along their axes and then draw other pieces of steel towards them. And it sort of forces it to look like there are these individual lines. Weber's instead of Weber's per meter squared, which is what is really in the real world. Any other questions? Okay, let's continue on. So you can see that the total field, because of this countervailing polarization field, is going to be less than this impressed field that's in proportional to your electric flux density. That's why, effectively, this constant, this permittivity constant, increases the stretchier the molecules are. So this is what makes good dielectrics. Insulating materials that have big, mushy molecules whose electrons like to kind of go to one side, like polymers, for example. That's a good example 
Um, there's certain ceramic materials that, as well that make really good uh, high permittivity substrates. Okay. So good. We got that out of the way. So now let's apply Gauss's law. Let's develop what this is. Where? Uh, that's correct for for a given D field, yeah, for a given impressed field. In other words, if you t in this example where we have the the capacitor, you take the dielectric out, you keep the charges the same. You've got an E field, and then you multiply epsilon out, you got a D field there. If you keep that system the same and you push a dielectric in, then the total field quantity will drop in that material. That's right. Yeah, this actually represents a form of stored energy. And it's one of the things that uh, kind of give capacitors a little more kick. You can dump more charge into them without raising the voltage because you can now store energy within the um, polarization of the individual molecules. Okay. Let's continue on. Now we're going to play a little charge counting game. So remember, if we had a charge Q, that the field for that point charge, a given distance R away in spherical coordinates is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared, and it's always in the R hat direction if this is the origin. Now, if I have a D field, my electric flux density vector, I multiply by that permittivity of the material, which in this case was epsilon naught. And we can see I am left with something that has units of coulombs per meter squared. And it always points away from the origin. And it has this really neat property that if I were to take the magnitude of this and integrate it over any sphere of any size, R squared, I would get the total enclosed charge. So if I say the surface area of a sphere which is 4 pi r squared, whatever radius I'm measuring the sphere with. If I multiply that by the magnitude of my electric flux density vector, magnitude is just the scalar part in front of the unit vector, q 4 pi r squared, I get Q, which is the enclosed charge. We notice that uh, about the way that we've constructed our electric flux density vector. And in fact, there's an even more elegant way to express that for this problem. And that is the enclosed surface integral. So you define a surface S, and the circle means it's an enclosed surface. It's not like a diaphragm. It's a balloon of some sort. 
and that is e if you do that, if you integrate that d vector dotted into a surface normal, so we count all the flux coming through that enclosing surface, that will be equal to our point charge Q. <clears throat> and the reason why this is a more elegant way to do it is because it allows us to define this process of counting the flux away from something uh, through a surface that is not necessarily a perfect sphere. This is, a, this is actually true for our little Coulombic point charge formula. Uh, no matter what the shape of the surface is, we could make it a, a, uh, an ellipsoid. We could make it a cube with six fat faces on each side. We could make it a tetrahedra. Wouldn't matter. As long as there's that point charge in there, a value Q, it'll still, this relationship will hold. And the reason why that, that is is largely because of this dot product. This guy is a little surface normal, if you'll remember from your multivariable calculus, that slides perpendicular across each surface, each square inch of surface area on the enclosing surface and picks up the contribution that is actually going through the surface, perpendicular to that. So if, if the surface is like this and the vector, uh, the flux density coming through is like this, only the vertical portion of that is actually counted in this integral. The part that's just skimming along the surface is disregarded because it's perpendicular to this. You slide around and add all that flux up. Um, and the nice thing about that uh, is that superposition holds. Well, first of all, let's, let's do our, this calculation just for the simple point charge formula, just to show that this actually happens. So my surface, in this case, is going to be a sphere. I'm going to do the exact same calculation I did there earlier, so I'm going to do it with this elegant vector calculus. I've got a point charge Q. I've got a sphere that defines my surface. It's at radius r. And that means that my variables of integration, let's, let's do our limits of integration first. I'm going to integrate along the surface of a sphere. Recall that diagram that I drew earlier with partial elements of integration. This was dr. Keep in mind, I give this in the back of your test uh, formula sheet on every exam, too, so that you don't have to memorize it. This is r sine theta d phi, and this unit here is r d theta. Let's see, I'm integrating over a sphere, spherical shell. That means I'm holding radius constant, so I don't need this one but I do need to slide around in phi and theta. So it's the product of these two that constitute my dn prime, my surface normal. That's going to define the magnitude of that vector. So I, get, I need an r. I need another r, so I'm going to have an r squared, r prime squared. These are variables of integration. I got a sine theta prime and a d phi prime and a d theta prime. And since this is a vector, I got to pick a vector that's always going to be normal to the surface of the sphere. Well, that's easy. That's always r hat, right? Always points away from the origin. So you see how I got the magnitude? I pick the elements of integration that correspond to my surface, just like I've been doing for all my other problems. How did I get the direction? By definition, this has to be a vector that's a surface normal. And conveniently, I'm in the spherical coordinate system, so I picked a sphere, and there's a nice simple unit vector that always points perpendicular to that. It never changes in that particular scenario. And let's see, what is this one? Well, we said it was Q over 4 pi r squ prime squared in the r hat direction. So I've got this vector dotted into this vector, bunch of scalar stuff in front. Let's start simplifying. r prime squared, sine theta prime, d phi prime, d theta prime, 
In the denominator, I got a 4 pi r prime squared. I got r hat here dotted into r hat. What's the unit vector dotted into itself? One. One. You're thinking of orthogonal unit vectors. Great. Look, r's cancel. And what I'm left with is the integral of this thing. What are my limits? Well, let's see. Let me go outer, inner to outer on this example. My phi prime limits of integration are going to be from 0 to 2 pi. I've got to go all the way around the world. And I also have to go from 0 to 180 degrees. So my theta limits of integration are going to be 0 to pi. Uh, yeah, that's right. Q is a constant. Put it on the outside. So okay, let's go ahead and do this. First of all, this is only phi. This is the only where the only place where phi shows up. The integral of phi prime with no other phi's in the integrand from zero to two pi is just two pi, right? That's pretty easy. So I got Q two pi. I gotta take this four pi out. And then what I'm left with is the integral of sine theta prime from 0 to pi. Well, let's see. Integral of sine theta, that's negative cosine of theta. If I evaluate that at uh, pi, that's negative a negative 1. And if I uh, evaluate, let's see. I should get 2. I should get 2. Yeah, negative, negative 1, minus, minus 1. So it's really just Q. There we go. So we've proved for this simple point charge example that if I do an integral of this type, I will at least get, in this spherical case, the enclosed charge in there. And in fact, we can hold this with superposition as well. So it just, doesn't just work for the point charge formula. I could put multiple charges in there, and it doesn't even have to be at the origin. It turns out that by Gauss's law states that I could integrate over any volume with any volume charge integral. And I get that result. And that turns out to be a powerful little tool for analysis. Because what it lets you do is say, well, I can, if I want to figure out how much charge is in a region, all I have to do is study the field around it and count the total amount of flux density. And in doing so, I can figure out what's inside. In fact, that's how I teach my 3025 students what, how to think about Gauss's law. Gauss's law, if you want to express it in word form, is it's what's inside that counts. <laughs> so we'll talk about that more on uh, Tuesday when you come back. Have a good weekend. Well, good. Let us wrap up our talk on Gauss's law in the integral form for charges. Remember what we're trying to do here. The, the whole cup, first couple of weeks of electrostatics, besides reviewing all that stuff that you probably forgot in your multivariable calculus class, your vector mathematics, your uh, vector calculus operations, spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, how to integrate multiple times in the same function. Uh, all those things are, um, you know, worthwhile knowing in and of themselves. However, what we're really doing is equipping you with a nice analytical tool set for you to be able to set up some complicated problems, possibly compute them later, uh, and, and be, being able to analyze things at their foundational levels in fee, terms of fields, charges, currents. So the first thing in the tool set that we gave you was Coulomb's law and the various integral forms that we came up with that, that describe field that is derived from volume, <coughs> charges, cur uh, current uh, surface charges, line charges, point charges. So that, we give you the charge, 
what's the field distribution about that charge? That's the fundamental question we were asking and answering in doing that. With Gauss's law, it's usually the opposite. You say, what is the field? Uh, well, we know the field. Now, what is the charge that gave rise to that field? And to that extent, we learned last time Gauss's law in integral form and that is if I take a surface flux integral this is a closed surface I put a little circle around my integral that's what mathematicians like to do when the, the surface encloses in on itself I do that with my electric flux density vector of course, any surface integral, I got a dot with respect to a surface normal. That's my element of integration that not only has the, those elements of integrations as their amplitude, so I can perform my integration, but it also has a direction. That's why it's a vector. It always points normal to the surface that you're integrating around. So there's a fun and functional dependence here that can often uh, pop out. And we said if you do that, if you count the flux, so you know, despite the fancy mathematics, that's all this is really doing, counting electric flux, integrating coulombs per meter squared over an area to get coulombs, and lo and behold, that is actually your enclosed charge. So if you integrate about the volume enc enclosed by that surface, if you integrate the charge density rho sub v, you get those two things. Extraordinarily elegant way to, to write this. Um, just recognize, too, that I did not draw the functional dependencies. Remember this vector d, as I slide around the surface, is going to be a function of my variable of integration, my x prime, y prime, and my z prime all along that surface. And likewise, this is also I'll be sliding over a volume instead of a surface area, but it's got an x prime and a y prime and a z prime. It's going to be a function of uh, three-dimensional position as well. And this is ex an extremely elegant way to express something that actually fundamentally is pretty simple. What this is, is it's sort of like a flux counting game. So you could even play this with discrete flux lines, so to speak, with units of coulombs uh, that you drew on the board. Let me give you an example of what the flux counting game is. So let's say I had <coughs> three coulombs of charge there at that point, and plus two coulombs charge of, of charge there, a minus one there, a minus two here, and a minus one. If you play uh, the flux counting game by drawing lines, one for every amount of charge at the point. So for example, if this is two, two units of charge, just draw two in any direction. And the rules are, the lines go away from positives, and they either have to go off in f to infinity, or they can land on negative charges. So if I just sort of, let's see, I'll not do that. Three, let's draw a line from there to there. Starts at three, ends at one. I need three leaving this one, I only have one going into that one. So I've got to draw two more. I've got to draw these kind of off to infinity. I could probably shoot one over here as well. And let's see. I need another one to come into infinity to get two going into there. And let's see. I'll just take one into infinity to go here. Okay, so this is a simple game to play. You understand the rules, right? This is not a Coulombic field. This is actually a generic field that I just sort of made up playing this flux counting game. Oh, yes. Uh, Lam. If, if everybody has their own style of playing the flux counting oh, I, game. No, 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 I'm just saying, is that is what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, I'm just... You just draw, make sure everything tries to connect, and then if you have any left over, run it to infinity. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure you, you could make the field that way. Okay, okay. That's right. I'm just uh, do, doing it this way because I feel like it. <laughs> yeah. And the nice thing about this is it... <clears throat> okay, let's, let's do the flux integral now. Why didn't you connect that positive to that integral? 
Yeah, oh, you don't have to. I mean, if if you want, I could. Yeah, I could. The point is, the flux counting game no, go, uh, holds no matter how you play it. Since the class is extremely neurotic, I will do it this way, and it will get the same result. Okay, good, good. We're all feeling better about this? Okay. Okay, so now, let's draw a random contour. Okay, there's our contour. Now we count the flux. We need to count the total amount of flux into and out of the contour. So let me do a tally. Positive, negative. Let's see, this is going in. That's gonna, I'm going to define that to be negative. So I'm going to put a hash mark. This one's going in. Another hash mark. Oh, but it comes out too, so that's going to give me a plus when I get around to here. So I come over here. Oh, that one's going out too. I get a plus. Uh, let's see, I go around. I don't see any more because I was insistently told that I had to draw this line this way. <laughs> so uh, what this says is I've got two pluses and two minuses. So Gauss's Law, I gave you the corny um, A&E li uh, or Lifetime movie summary of Gauss's Law last time. Do you remember what that said? It's, it's what's inside that counts. This is like, uh, you know, um, electromagnetism uh, as taught by like that Oprah magazine on the, <laughs> on the shelf of the supermarket, right? It's what's inside that counts, man. That's really what Ga Gauss's Law says. And sure enough, if I count the stuff inside, I got negative one, positive two, and negative one. So that's a net zero charge. You could agree that I could count the flux however I would have liked, and I still would have gotten this, this result. I could have had this one going out and then this one coming in, and it would not have changed the net flux through my, my uh, <coughs> volume here. And it doesn't matter how I draw that contour, what direction. I could draw it up here, and it wouldn't really matter, provided I played the flux game consistently. I got two coming in, two coming out, nothing's inside. So really, this con concept of a contour integral, it's kind of a, a basic field quantity. In fact, when we take a look at the differential form of Gauss's law, well, we, we stumble across the divergence theorem, which basically says uh, the volume integration of the divergence of D is the same thing as, as counting the flux that comes out of an enclosing uh, surface. So it holds for any kind of vector field. It's actually an intrinsic mathematical property. Doesn't matter what that vector field is. The force field due to gravitation. You know, completely different phenomenon than electromagnetism. Yeah? The net charge won't always be zero, will it? Uh, nope, nope. I could have drew it this way. I could intentionally have a very positive net charge. And you can see that one, two, three, four, five come out of that surface. And sure enough, I have two plus five inside. Okay, so that, that's the, the high-level, touchy-feely uh, uh, example of, of how to do flux counting and the principle behind Gauss's law. Let's do another example when it comes off an old test. I thought that interested you. Perked right up about that. Okay, let's see. How do we want to do this? Oh, I know a good one. I know a good one. Here we go. Here's a common kind of question that I ask on tests. Okay. Let's say we have... Let's do it this way. We have centered at the origin a volume charge distribution, and I'm going to express it in this spherical coordinate system. It's going to be a function of r, v, and theta. However, it's actually just going to be a function of r. I mean, it's going to be a constant rho naught over r squared. 
So that's coulombs per meter cubed. The total will be the total units of this thing. So rho naught obviously has coulombs per meter units, and then they would divide them by meter squared. So that's coulombs per meter squared. That's our volume charge density. And what this physically means is that the, the charge is at a maximum close to the origin, and then it tapers away. So you can imagine there's probably a lot of positive charges here spread out evenly in space. So then as you get farther away, they get more dispersed. The volume charge density, of course, I'm drawing it like it's discrete, but of course this is a continuous distribution of charge. The volume uh, charge density falls off. And so the question now is what is the radial component of the E field? E sub R as a function of R phi and theta. So let's sketch what this would look like as a function of r. Technically it should only be a function of r because my problem has spherical symmetry, right? There's no dependence on phi and theta in my charge distribution, only the direct only the distance away from the origin. So it doesn't matter where I look this problem from, it always looks the same. Uh, so we should expect the final E field could be written as <coughs> E at any arbitrary point in space is really just E sub R as a function of just R. And it should be in the R hat direction because the field should always point away from the charge or towards it if it's negative, but that along that same line. Okay, so here's an example where Gauss's law can really help out a lot. Um, because, in fact, in, in these problems with a lot of symmetry, a lot of times, even though we said, you know, you can use Gauss's law to count the flux coming out of a, a surface area and figure out what the charge is inside, a lot of these problems with symmetry, you can simplify the problem enough where you can do the reverse. You can figure out what is the field as a function of charge in a way that would have been really difficult with that Coulombic integral that's got to slide all over the world to pick things up. Because remember, it's what's inside that counts. <coughs> okay. So let's see. Let's write. Let's go over to this board and do it. Let's see. We've got Gauss's general law says surface <laughs> integral of the flux should be equal to the volume integral of the charge. Okay, well clearly we're in the spherical coordinate system, so I'm going to line the problem up and choose my enclosing surface area to be a sphere uh, and the volume to be the, the volume inside. That of course lines everything up nicely with the coordinate system, which happens to line up nicely with the symmetry of the problem, and so we should get a much simpler result than if we had tried to do this in Cartesian. In fact, it'll be so simple that this first one we don't even have to integrate. We don't even have to know any calculus to do that. Why is that? Well, think of it this way. My D field is my permittivity in farads per meter times my E field, which we said was actually just the R component of an E field. All the other uh, components should be zero. And that will only depend on r, and it will be in the r hat direction. I'm going to have to integrate this over this enclosing spherical surface. However, I also know that regardless of what my actual elements of integration are, that surface normal always points away from the, the sphere, the surface of the sphere, which is basically the r hat unit vector, right? That's the definition of the r hat unit vector. Always points away from the origin. So if your sphere is centered at the origin, always points away. So this should be something, 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 r hat. In fact, if you wanted to get, get down to it and actually work this out manually, this would be r squared sine theta d phi d theta 
picking it off one of those diagrams. But it turns out we're not going to need it because I don't want to do calculus to solve this problem. Everything is so conveniently lined up that really all I need to do is take the magnitude of my flux, which is independent of angle, and multiply it by the surface area of my sphere. What's the surface area of the sphere of radius r? 4 pi r squared. That's right. We just use geometry. Geometry is always easier than calculus. That's the surface area in meters squared. This is my flux density in coulombs per meter squared. Permittivity times e sub r as a function of r. And voila, I'm done. I didn't have to integrate anything. And I can do that because this is all uniform. doesn't depend on phi and theta. Now, the volume integral is a little bit different. I've got to integrate. Oh, yes. Could you show us, like, I know you're saying it's a sphere and stuff like that, but would you be able to show us, like, with that diagram, like, what you're integrating over? Like, is it mm -hmm. like a ball around? That's ball? right. It's, it's an, ooh, and I should put a circle here. It's an enclosing surface. So if I, I had a, the origin here, I'm going to go out to a distance r. And of course, I'm doing this on a two-dimensional paper. I wish I could draw in three dimensions. Put a bubble on it, like a, like a little hash mark. <laughs> <laughs> My bubbles look weird. No, because you didn't put a bubble. Like a circular bubble. Oh, a circular bubble. bubbling in your head. You're right. right. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've ever been artistically critiqued <laughs> on, my, on my homework problem or my test problem. Okay. Okay, okay. This is a sphere, regardless of how badly I drew it. The limits of integration on this sphere are going to be from 0 to some distance r that I'm going to be away from there. And let's see, I'm going to go from 0 to 2 pi. And that's going to be in my azimuth integration. And I'm going to go from 0 to pi in my angle of elevation like that. So let me write this out here. We've got dr is my, corresponds to my first limit. My second limit is r sine theta uh, d phi. That's my azimuth element of integration. And then my elevation angle, uh, element of integration, I'm running out of space here, but I got to put r d theta. So I got two r's. And let me put primes on them, because these are variables of integration, whereas this is a point of observation that I've put in the limit. Put a r prime there, prime there, prime there, prime there, prime there. OK, that's good. And of course, what am I integrating? Charge. And unlike all the other problems that I've given you so far, I gave you one with a non-uniform charge density. So I got this r prime squared. That right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and solve this. R prime squared cancels with these two R's here, and I can take this rho naught as a constant outside the integral. So let me simplify. What's left over is dr prime sine theta prime, d phi prime, d theta prime. OK, I integrate dr prime from 0 to r. That's easy. That's just r. I integrate d phi prime from 0 to 2 pi. That's easy. That's just 2 pi. Now I've got to integrate 
sine theta prime d theta prime from 0 to pi. That's slightly not as easy, but it's still pretty easy, right? That's going to be cosine of theta prime with a negative in front of it evaluated from 0 to pi. What's cosine of pi? Negative 1. Minus what's cosine of 0? Positive 1. I got negative 1 plus negative 1, that's negative 2, then I got to take the minus sign. Oh, that wasn't that bad either, that's 4. <coughs> Bless you. Or excuse me, that's 2, which becomes 4 when you multiply it by the other 2. And I can cancel. There's a 4 pi over there. Look, there's a 4 pi over here. I got an r squared over here. I got just one r over here, so I can do this. And I can take this permittivity and throw it over there. Voila! Done! Look how easy that was with Gauss's law. Our, our E field has a radial component in the R hat direction that falls off 1 over R. So in the test, I'd go back over here and I'd say, well, I'd sketch this to be like this. A lot of times, I think this is a problem when I gave it on a test. I said, just sketch, sketch and label. 1 over R, so it should look proportional to that, like that. Remember, if this was a point charge centered at the origin, it'd be 1 over r squared, which would look something like that. Much steeper. But of course, this is a different kind of charge distribution. There's a graded volume of charge that kind of falls off 1 over r squared, uh, even though you keep piling on extra charge. So the farther you move out, the, uh, the less field you see, but it doesn't taper off as much as the point charge formula. And you only really have to worry about the charge inside the sphere because it's what's inside that counts. Does that make sense? Everybody understand how to do that? Uh, yeah? Would there be like a generic solution for something like that that's spherical? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a nice canonical problem that actually has a nice easy solution. So it's kind of a good template for working on this. If I change the distribution of the charge density, though, you might get something different. Uh, well, if I made it uniform, for example. Now, if I made it uniform, it would have been easier to calculate, right? Because you could have said, instead of doing a volume integral, you say, oh, I got this uniform coulombs per meter cubed. I just need to multiply that by the volume of the sphere. You could have evaluated that integral with geometry again. 4 pi over 3 times r to the cube. Yeah. Could you explain again the left side and right side of that equation? In words? Okay, this is good. No, no, this is a really good question because it's important to know the word form of the equation that, that we're studying. And this is actually one of Maxwell's equations. In fact, usually for this class, I am so easy. I. On the, on the final exam, one of my questions, it's like 50 points. It's a quarter of the test grade. I just give it to you ahead of time. And it's basically memorize Maxwell's equations. Give them to me in point form, integral form, and word form. Because the word form is important. Much as I like to make fun of Oprah's magazines, it sells, outsells anything that I ever wrote. <laughs> so how would you explain this to Oprah? Remember the flux coming out of an enclosed surface is equal to the total amount of charge that that surface encloses. That's how you say it in mathematical terms. Oh, sure, sure. <clears throat> the electric flux density, the total amount of electric flux coming out of an enclosing surface is equal to the sur uh, uh, the volume charge, the total amount of charge in that enclosed volume. That's the precise way to say it. I'll give you the, the word forms on a uh, crib note sheet to study leading up to the exam. So, Now, we have an, a more elegant way of expressing this in the next unit when we talk about the differential form of Gauss's law. And that's when it gets really kind of like touchy-feely. Um, 
you, you're actually going to take touchy-feely vector calculus with Professor Durkin, and uh, you will be able to look at vector calculus formulas and know exactly what they mean without solving them. Right now, it probably just looks mystical. It's, it's like, uh, I don't know, like, like you see all these like gradients and curls and divergences, and it might as well just be like, I don't know, Gandalf writing a spell or something in one of your movies. Some crazy elven language or something. Cameron, you got a question? Oh, uh, yes. We'll fix that, though. We'll fix that. Uh, why did uh, you take the magnitude of the surface? Oh, oh, okay. So here was the reasoning. There are two things we always want to avoid in this class. Vector calculus and, uh, well, vector calculus. If multivariable integrations and vectors, I should say. I put them together. So this guy right here is always in the r hat direction. And the surface normal is always in the r hat direction in the sphere, too. So they're always going to be collinear. So the problem is when I have something that um, is not always collinear inside of an integral, I have to take into account, I have to actually go through longhand and actually do the integration, because sometimes they stretch out. And if they go to 90 degrees, they don't contribute anything. Sometimes it contributes the full amount of the amplitude when everything is lined up. Well, here, everything is lined up. So really, I'm just going to do this ahead of time dot r with r to get 1. And then this doesn't even depend. This is exactly the same here and here and here, no matter where I observe on the surface of a sphere. And so instead of actually integrating everything out, it's like integrating a constant, right? I can literally pop this out and just multiply by the surface area of that uh, enclosing surface. Geometrical shortcuts to multivariable calculus, right? You're always free to take them in this class instead of integrating. Any more questions? Anything else? No?